you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13. We're going to look at a single verse of Scripture in Isaiah's prophecy. Isaiah chapter 13 in my Bibles. Chapter 13 is titled, A Prophecy Against Babylon. So that gives us a little bit of context. When you find Isaiah 13, 6, if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to read just one verse this morning. The prophet writes, Well, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Now, most, most directly, most soon, a couple of hundred years after Isaiah wrote this, the Babylonians conquered Judah under Nebuchadnezzar. You remember that. That was the most immediate fulfillment of this prophecy. However, there are end times implications to this prophecy as well, as many prophecies have multiple fulfillments. And in the last days, we will learn about the day of the Lord being near. We will hear about the day of the Lord coming. And we will also hear about the fall of Babylon. And so, over the next few weeks, we're going to be touching on these different issues and these different topics as prophesied by Isaiah. Father God, as we come to you this morning, I want to thank you for today, and I want to thank you for the privilege that we have to gather in your house freely here in this country. God, I just pray, Lord, as we do so today, that you would bless us and bless all of our Christian brothers and sisters in and around the world who are coming uh, to worship you on this Lord's day. God, I do pray that you would hear in our sanctuary this morning that you would hinder any distractions or any uh, things that would take our mind off of you and allow us, Lord, to focus specifically on you and to hear your word being proclaimed this morning that we not all receive it, myself included, and that we might go out of this place this morning knowing that we've heard your voice. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're being seated, you can turn back to Revelation chapter 16, where we find ourselves this morning as we continue through the book of Revelation and our study in this great vision of John. Last week we began a two-part discussion on the seven bowls, or the seven plagues, as they are also known, God's final series of judgments upon the earth. We learned in the first message last week, as we began talking about and introducing the bowls, that though their effects will certainly impact the entire world, the primary target of these judgments will be the beast, which is the Antichrist, and his kingdom and his followers, those who have worshipped his image, those who have taken his mark. As we learned in last week's message, the first five bowls will severely cripple the Antichrist's iron grip over the world during this time, and they will weaken his authoritative rule. So this morning, as we cover the sixth and the seventh bowl, we find ourselves talking about a, a scene or an episode in which the Antichrist's monarchy is quickly unraveling. The power which he held and wielded throughout much of the Great Tribulation is beginning to slip away. And God's judgment is now being pointed directly at him and his throne. And he is becoming increasingly desperate. And he is becoming increasingly unhinged. And in this process, he will turn his attention away from merely persecuting the people of God, as he has been doing. And he will turn his attention directly to God and endeavor to take his fight directly against the Almighty, in a last-ditch effort to save his throne and to cling to his power. 
the Antichrist will be inspired by Satan. Now, Satan has a long and documented history of fighting against God and losing. <laughs> we Earlier in this series, when we talked about the dragon, one of the descriptors that was used during that passage is that he is a loser. He has a long history of losing, but guess what? Today we can add a word to that. He's a sore loser. <laughs> And he continues to think that he can defeat God. And so, inspired by Satan, and with Satan's help, the Antichrist, the beast, will muster every resource at his disposal. He will rally all of his forces and all of those he can gather to fight alongside him for this great and epic battle. This final affront or, or front against God. So let's continue where we left off. Remember, the angels are pouring out the bowls of God's wrath upon the earth, and particularly upon the Antichrist and his followers. The first point this morning is simply called the sixth bowl, where we find ourselves today. Let's look at Revelation 16, starting in verse 12. It says, The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings of the east. So as we continue our playing out the scene in our mind that John is seeing, that he is envisioning the revelation that God gave him, John describes now seeing the sixth angel pour out his bowl on the Euphrates River. Now, we talked about the Euphrates River earlier in the series. It, it is important for me to, to help you understand that the Euphrates River is, is the main primary river in the Middle East, in uh, Mesopotamia, in, in the Fertile Crescent area. It's the main one. It would be like saying the Mississippi River for those of us in the United States. It would be like saying the Amazon River for those who are in uh, Brazil and South America. It would be like saying the Nile River for those who are in Egypt. This was the main river, the main water resource of the Middle East. John saw the angel pour his bowl out on the river, which, by the way, let's not forget, at this point would be blood. Remember last week, all the water, all the rivers were turned to blood. So at this point, the waters that are in the river are actually blood. As we tie all these things together, it's important to keep the story complete. But nevertheless, the Euphrates River dried up. Now, why was that necessary? Well, it tells us in order to provide for easy passage over the river so that large numbers of people could walk, or in this case march, or ride over the dried up river, thus preparing the way for the kings of the east and their armies. As I said earlier in Revelation, we mentioned the Euphrates River once before. Back in Revelation chapter 9, at the blast of the sixth trumpet, in Revelation 9, starting in verse 13, I'm not there, I'm in the wrong place. Give me a second. Revelation 9, in chapter 13, the angel blasted the trumpet during the trumpet judgments, and it says, The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from heaven from the four horns at the golden altar, which is before God, saying, to the sixth angel, release the four angels, the angel of the sixth trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who have been prepared for this day and hour and month and year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. Remember, these were with the one-third judgments. And the number of armies of the horsemen were 200 million. Now, I won't continue reading that because we already talked about that earlier in this series. But just by way of reminder, these four angels had been bound at the river Euphrates. 
And when the sixth trumpet blasted, earlier on during the Great Tribulation, these angels were released along with an army numbering 200 million that went out and killed a third of the world's population. And if you remember those verses or look back, you will see that these troops had strange features, physical features. And they had lethal and, and, and peculiar abilities to kill a third of the earth's population during the years of Great Tribulation. And I told you in that sermon, and I will restate it today, I, as well as many others, believe that this huge army was not, not only that of the Antichrist, but that these four angels that were released were his generals or commanders over the various branches of this army, and the millions of soldiers that we see were demonic. They were demons. Perhaps the very same who had been released from the pit of Tartarus during the fifth trumpet that was immediately before it. Now I'm not saying that there weren't some humans that joined in, but we have talked about the river Euphrates before. It wasn't dried up at that point. It would have been only one third blood at that point. But this army of Satan led by these angels from the Euphrates that had been bound at the Euphrates had been on a rampage now for the last few years during the reign of the Antichrist. And as we come to this bowl, we're going to see the Euphrates dry up and we're going to see a preparation for a battle against God. The second point this morning is called the King's Gathering. Back in Revelation chapter 16, we'll read 13 through 16. But before I read the king's gather, I just want to let you know that the gathering of the kings is the direct result of and is therefore associated with the sixth bowl. Okay, the gathering of the kings isn't necessarily a bowl itself, but it is the natural outflow of what happens because of the sixth bowl. So they go together one with another. Let's see what happens. Verse 13 and following. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which will go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for war. The war of the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place in Hebrew which is called Harmageddon. So, John sees three unclean spirits. He compares them to frogs. Now, let's not get overly hung up on this comparison. Sometimes we get so caught up in the minutiae we miss the main point. Most likely the reason he called them frogs is because they're unclean. Frogs are unclean animals. The, uh, the amphibians, like the frogs and the toads and the lizards and whatnot, were unclean. The Jews weren't to touch them. They weren't, certainly weren't to eat them. They weren't supposed to have anything to do with them. They were unclean animals. And these spirits are unclean. Another possible suggestion would be this. If you remember, one of the ten plagues of Israel was frogs devouring the land. And they were just a loathsome scourge that just destroyed everything in Egypt. Perhaps he's referring to that. These, these spirits weren't frogs, <laughs> but they're unclean spirits like frogs. They're loathsome spirits like the frogs. And they went out. Notice where they went out from. The mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Here, John actually, in a single phrase, gives us all three characters of the unholy trinity. Remember a couple of uh, uh, chapters back, 
John did a character study of each one of these figures. And we talked about the dragon. And we talked about the beast from the sea, who is also oftentimes just referred to as the beast. But that is the Antichrist. And then we talked about the beast from the earth, who is the false prophet. The false prophet mimics the Holy Spirit, remember? The Antichrist, or sometimes just referred to as the beast, the beast from the sea, mimics Jesus. And, of course, Satan the dragon seeks to mimic God. Unclean spirits come out from them. These are, these are demonic evil spirits whose source is the unholy trinity. And they go out to all of the kings of the earth with one intention, and that is to entice or to convince these kings to join the Antichrist in a massive and direct assault against God. And as a result of their manipulative persuasion, several of the earth's kings will agree and they will dispatch their armies to Israel. And as you would suspect, some of these armies will be coming from the east the kings of the east, westward on foot to descend upon Israel and they will have to cross over the Euphrates River which has been dried up so that they can just march right across it. And the kings of the east and all of the kings who align themselves with the Antichrist will send their militaries and their forces to converge with the demonic armies of the Antichrist so that all of the enemies of God, both human and demon, will be gathered together to wage war with the Almighty. They will gather together in a place called Armageddon, or Armageddon, as we know it in English. The word Armageddon only appears once in the entire Bible. And yet it's the subject of much, much talk and fascination. But this is the only instance where we see the word Armageddon. In Hebrew, it means Mount Megiddo. Mount Megiddo. Now here's the strange thing about Mount Megiddo. There is no Mount Megiddo. In fact, Mount Megiddo is never mentioned anywhere in the Bible other than this name that is used here. There are no events that happen on Mount Megiddo. Geologists, are, I'm sorry, geographers, Bible, Bible geographers have looked they can't find any significant land feature that would be referred to as Mount Megiddo. However, most commentators suggest that Armageddon refers to the many hills, the, the rolling hills, if you will, that surround the plains of Megiddo. There is a plain of Megiddo, but plains are flat. They're not mountains. But there are hills that kind of surround that plain. The plain of Megiddo is located about 60 miles north of Jerusalem. The hills that surround it naturally form a valley in between. And so sometimes the plain of Megiddo is oftentimes referred to as the valley of Megiddo. The Valley of Megiddo is mentioned in Scripture multiple times. In fact, it's the site of several significant occurrences. During the era of the Judges, Barak's victory over the Canaanites, remember he was the military leader for uh, Deborah. Deborah was the judge and Barak was her military man. 
His victory over the Canaanites took place in the Valley of Megiddo. Later, during the book of Judges, we read about Gideon. We remember Gideon. Gideon was cowardly, and then God changed him. Gideon's victory over the Midianites occurred in the Valley of Megiddo. There were also some tragedies that we find in the Bible, Bible that occurred there. King Saul and his two sons were slaughtered by the Philistines in the Valley of Megiddo in their foolhardy assault on the Philistines there. Do you remember the young, dynamic King Josiah who led revival in Judah? But then he brashly went out to confront the Egyptians and Pharaoh Necho. Necho. He was killed in the Valley of Megiddo. So the Valley of Megiddo is a prominent site. And it is there that the kings of the earth will gather alongside the forces of the Antichrist in preparation to wage war with God. I want to just insert or, or notice that there is a verse inserted here in verse 15. I don't want to skip over it. John puts a quotation here that is taken from the Gospels. He writes, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and people will not see his shame. Who is the uh, speaker there? Jesus, that's right. It's Christ. If we go back to Matthew chapter 24, verse 43, well, actually, I'm going to read 42 through 44. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore, be on alert. You do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have been on alert and would have not allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think that he will. You know, Jesus made an interesting comparison here. Let's think about this for a minute. Any thief worth his salt at thievery <laughs> is not going to give you notice of when he plans to come and rob you. He's not going to give you a call one afternoon and say, okay, sir, tonight I plan on breaking into your house about 3 a.m. I plan on coming through the back window and I'm just going to crawl right in there. I'm going to go and I'm going to take, you know, your your flat screen TV and I'm going to go through your, you know, your uh, valuables and I'm going to just grab stuff, but I just wanted to let you know that, that I'll be coming. Thieves don't do that. Not even the wet bandits were dumb enough to do that, Owen. <laughs> Sorry about that. That was a reference to Home Alone, one of Owen's favorite movies. But nevertheless, thieves don't do that. But Jesus uses that to make a contrast. He says, look, I am coming. I'm not coming to rob you. I'm coming again to redeem you and or to judge those who haven't accepted me. But, but the point he says is, I am giving you notice. I'm coming. Now, we don't know exactly what time he's coming, but the Bible is emphatic. And it says it over and over again. Jesus is coming again. And so, beloved, we, we don't have any excuse not to be ready. When Jesus comes, we shouldn't be surprised by His arrival. He says, keep your clothes on. <laughs> Obviously, he's, he's talking metaphorically, but He's saying, you know, don't, don't, don't be undressed and unready and unprepared, I'm telling you, I'm coming again. So stay ready. Stay dressed. Stay prepared. Stay watchful. Stay vigilant. Stay active. Stay engaged. Don't go to sleep. I'm coming. Be ready. 
Now, it's interesting to me that we have a passage here where John is describing the forthcoming battle of Armageddon. <laughs> He's describing the gathering of all of these mass of armies to fight against God. He's talking about how all of these things are being prepared and set up so that the final battle can take place. He is talking about all of these details and then he inserts in here, by the way, Christian, and when I say Christian, I'm referring specifically to tribulation Christians who miss the rapture. By the way, you need to be ready. And indirectly speaking, those of us on this side of the rapture who still have a chance to be raptured, we should stay ready too. We need to be ready. Because Jesus is coming again. We should live accordingly. So basically what the sixth bowl does is it sets up it sets up the battle of Armageddon. It provides an unobstructed path so that the kings of the earth can align themselves with the Antichrist by crossing unobstructed over the Euphrates River, but that's just one piece. The idea is that it's putting all the pieces in place and it's removing all of the obstacles that might be out there so that the Battle of Armageddon can take place. The Sixth Bowl is not the Battle of Armageddon. The Sixth Bowl is a precursor to the Battle of Armageddon so that the battle is possible. Now that being said, the timing of this bowl is therefore very near to the end of the Great Tribulation. Armies don't just show up instantaneously to a location. It will take a few weeks or maybe even a month or so to transport all of those folks and everybody together in Israel. So this bowl, in my mind, would take place a few weeks or months before the end of the Tribulation, but we're getting very close to the end as the armies gather at Armageddon to fight against the Lord. Let's finish the chapter, the seventh bowl. Revelation 16, starting in verse 17 to the end of the chapter, it says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake, as it had not been since man came upon the earth. And the great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And Babylon the great was remembered in, uh, before God to give her the cup of his wine and his fierce wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and large hailstones, about a hundred pounds each, came from heaven upon men. And the men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hell, because its plague was extremely severe. So John now watches as the seventh angel pours out his bowl upon the air. And he heard a voice coming from the throne out of the temple that said, It is done. And to summarize the natural phenomenon that was going on, there was thunder, there was lightning, and there was a great earthquake. Scripture says... It was more powerful than any other earthquake that had ever come upon the earth. It says that the great city, which is most likely a reference to Jerusalem, most commentators agree with that assessment, the great city was split into three parts. And it says many other cities around the world collapsed completely as a result of this violent earthquake. Scripture says that God poured out His wrath upon Babylon the Great. And even the mountains and the islands were shaken and displaced by this violent, global, worldwide earthquake. But if that wasn't enough, in addition to the earthquake, did you notice there are huge hailstones fell from the sky? My translation says they weighed about 100 pounds each. That is, that's a guesstimate. If you look in the original language, it measures it in talents, and talents can be uh, interpreted 
slightly differently. And so the more, the, mo the most educated uh, estimate that I could find is that they weighed anywhere from 70 to 100 pounds. So 100 might be the high end, but I promise you, I don't want to be hit by a 70-pound hailstone either. You know, if I'm hit by a 70-pounder, 80-pounder, 90-pounder, 100-pounder, I think it's going to have the same result. So uh, that's not good. Huge hailstones falling from the sky. And what did the people do? They repented. No. They continued to blaspheme God. Again, indicating that these judgments, while they affect everybody, are primarily targeted to those who are enemies of God. Just by way of reminder, I will point out to you that earlier in this series we talked about another smaller earthquake that hit Jerusalem. Back in chapter 11, verse 13, we saw that there was an earthquake that took place I I propose that it will take place at the midpoint of the tribulation, which would be roughly three and a half years before this one. We read about this earthquake when we were talking about the two witnesses. You remember the two witnesses? I believe that God will have place these two witnesses on the earth and they will minister during the first half of the tribulation in the church's absence. And do you remember what happened at the midpoint of the tribulation when the Antichrist comes to power? He executed the two witnesses. And they uh, were laid out on the streets to be, uh, their, their corpses, their bodies, to be ridiculed and taunted. But after three and a half days, you remember what happened? They rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. And what else happened? There was an earthquake. An earthquake in Jerusalem. And the scripture says back in that chapter that one-tenth of the city fell. One-tenth. And that 7,000 people were killed. Now that's a significant, that's a significant disaster. But beloved, that earthquake was localized to Jerusalem. And only a tenth of the city fell. When we read about the earthquake with the seventh and final bowl, we're talking about an earthquake that will impact the entire world. Cities across the world will fall. Jerusalem will be split into three parts. This earthquake will not be localized. It will be the greatest earthquake that the world has ever known. Shaking so bad that as we saw here, even that mountains and the islands will be shaken and displaced. Yeah. Something else that I would point out in detail in this passage is that John heard a voice. Now notice where the voice came from. It came from the throne, yet out of the temple. Take a moment to process that a little bit. It came from the throne and out of the temple. That language suggests either a very close proximity between the throne room of God and the temple of God in heaven, or perhaps, as some have interpreted, and we've talked about earlier in this series, a oneness between the two. That in fact, the throne of God is the temple of God. Now, we've, we've hit on both of those different interpretations, and to be honest with you, I don't know. <laughs> and neither does, neither does anybody else, for sure. But the voice... Of God, most certainly. It came from the throne and out of the temple. Whose voice would that be? That would be the voice of God. What's going on in the temple right now? It is still filled with smoke. Remember? God's glory throughout the entire pouring out of all the bowls, including this last one. God's voice is heard, and what does it say? It is done. What does that remind you of? Jesus, hanging on the cross, cries out, It is finished. Beloved, it's the same phrase. It's the same words. God cries out, It is done. It is a shout of victory. It is a, it is a cry that the mission has been accomplished. 
based on this cry, based on these words, I would submit to you, and I'm not alone in this opinion, that these things will take place after the battle of Armageddon is complete, when Satan and the Antichrist have been defeated. And after their defeat, the Lord then would say, it is done. So it helps me, at least in my mind, to understand the timing of these events. If that is the case, then basically what we see here is we see the sixth bowl and the consequences of the sixth bowl preparing for the battle of Armageddon. And then we see the natural disasters and the declaration of God that take place during and or after the battle of Armageddon. And what we skip in between is the battle of Armageddon which we will get to <laughs> later in this book. There are several notable parallels between the seventh bowl and the sixth and seventh seals. And I'll point them out real quickly because I'm running out of time. If you go all the way back to the seal judgments, after the breaking of the sixth seal, back in Revelation 6, there was a great earthquake. The sky split apart. And every mountain and island was moved from its place. Also during the sixth seal, the stars fell from the sky like hail and people hid themselves in caves to be protected from it. At the breaking of the seventh seal, fire from God's altar was cast down upon the earth like a flaming hailstorm. There was lightning, there was thunder, and there was a great earthquake. And now we see similar events being described with the seventh bowl. Personally, I believe that all three of these judgments are referring to the same occurrence. They're referring to an event called the Day of the Lord. And I believe it will take place immediately before Jesus' return to the earth. I told you a week or two ago that I believe in a chronologically layered approach to understanding the uh, judgments, the series of judgments, the series of the bowls and the trumpets. In essence, what that means is the seals will start first, but they'll persist all the way to the end of the tribulation. The trumpets will start second, but they too will persist all the way to the end of the tribulation. And then the bowls that we see here are going to start and go in pretty quick succession right at the very end of the tribulation, but they too will end at the end of the tribulation, which means the seventh seal and the seventh trumpet and the seventh bowl are all referring to and taking place at the same time. And that's what I'm saying here. They're all referring to the day of the Lord. Remember Isaiah when we started this message says the day of the Lord is near. The day of the Lord is near. Let me conclude by talking a little bit about the day of the Lord for just a minute and we're done. There are words in the Bible that have multiple meanings. For example, the word Passover. The word Passover sometimes refers specifically to the night of the Passover of the death angel that we read about in the Old Testament. But on other occasions, it refers to a full 24-hour day upon which the Jews commemorated the original Passover. And they would go to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage for the Passover. But on other occasions, it refers to the entire week-long festival of the Passover, which included the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of First Fruits and other type of things throughout the entire week. So it could refer to a, a, a night or a day or a full week. In the same way, we use the word, the phrase, the day of the Lord. Sometimes it refers to a single calendar day. Other times, I believe it refers to a season or several days or even weeks, possibly. And so here is my interpretation of what will happen on the day of the Lord, that 24-hour day. I believe after much anticipation, 
that the tribulation will come to an abrupt end on the day of the Lord when there will be an outbreak of several cosmic events and signs and natural disasters, which we have talked about throughout this book. There will be the Battle of Armageddon, which will be the culmination of Babylon's fall, and we'll talk more about Babylon in the next two weeks. And following the Battle of Armageddon will be the second coming of Jesus, who will set foot on Mount Zion, greeted by the 144,000 Messianic Jews. That will all occur on the 24-hour day of the Lord, in my view. But afterwards, there will be an extended period of mourning by the unsaved of the earth over Babylon, which has fallen. And then that God will be setting up His kingdom, or Christ will be setting up His kingdom on the earth. Christ is God, by the way. But Jesus will be setting up His kingdom on the earth. And there will be a harvest judgment, which we've talked about, or some call it the sheep goat judgment, that will take place as well. Now these things will take place in the days and or weeks following Christ's actual return. Yet, most end time scholars typically include these events as integral parts of what we would call the day of the Lord. Meaning that the day of the Lord is also not just a single day, but a season that would include not only Jesus' return, but his judgment. The upcoming chapters, chapter 17 and 18, focus on and delve deeply into the mystery of Babylon. What is this Babylon that will fall? What is this Babylon that John has been talking about and alluding to and mentioning here in these last few chapters? We're going to talk about that in chapter 17 and 18. The mystery of Babylon, her impending doom, the grief that will be shown over her by the peoples of the world when she falls. I will tell you right now, there are various interpretations about the identity of Babylon the Great and Mystery Babylon. I'm going to give you mine over the next couple of weeks, but you're free to disagree with me, and it's okay. But we're going to save that discussion for the next two weeks and not get into it just yet. So here's what I'll leave you with today. The sixth and the seventh bowl, God will prepare for the Battle of Armageddon. In between the 6th and the 7th bowl, the Battle of the Armageddon will occur, or perhaps even as the 7th bowl is unfolding. And then with the 7th bowl, the great day of the Lord will be upon us, or upon those who missed the rapture and are present at that time. Which, by the way, leads me to the invitation. <laughs> you don't want to miss the rapture. You don't want to pass away unsaved, or... Uh, I'm sorry, or even live on unsaved and miss the rapture into the tribulation. Either one of those things would be bad. Bottom line, Jesus come again. We need Jesus. And so, if you don't know Him today, whether you're watching online or if you're here this morning, I pray that you would accept Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior and experience the forgiveness that only He can give you. If you are born again, then help, help us as a church Join with us and help us to proclaim the message of Jesus to those who are lost so that they might be saved as well. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for this message. Lord, I pray that you would uh, help us take it to heart. God, I pray that you would uh, just impress upon us again that you are coming, that you have given us notice, and that we are to live accordingly, and we are to be prepared. Because your judgment will take place in your time and in your providence. Help us, Lord, until that day comes to be vigilant, to not only live as your people, but to tell others how they can, too, live as your child. Forgive us where we fail you, for we ask it in Jesus' name.